Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 548. This is 548 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope you're doing well wherever this show may find you. Hope you're doing well wherever it may find you, my friends. Hope you're doing good. Hope you're doing well. I'm back in the scene, back in the zone. Hope you're feeling well. I'm feeling fantastic. Got water inside of me. Got a nice meal inside of me fasting until the next day and I'm feeling pretty good I'm not gonna lie even though I've had to go back and start from scratch when it comes to the hard 75 I got to 15 days and my willpower broke unfortunately I had to go and do some you know some DJ playing and hanging out with friend and you know you know how it goes and you start one thing the other thing starts and then suddenly you're in a whole different plane and you wonder to yourself, man, I should have done that. It's not worth it. It really wasn't worth it. And you have to be honest, it probably wasn't in the long run. Good to catch up, obviously, with friends and stuff. But in terms of um, doing what I actually wanted to do, my actual long-term plan, it probably wasn't the best, I think, um, to kind of uh, to break my willpower with. But hey, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. We start again. So starting again from the, what, 2nd of Feb. So whenever this comes out, you obviously be here in the first day. I you know I last until fifteen days. Gonna go again, seventy five hard. I've already mentioned it to you already. Fit read ten pages, two exercises a day. I think one of them has to be outside. A gallon of water you have to drink, um, and no alcohol. Stick to a diet and all that good stuff. So let's see how that goes. Um, and then if I do that correctly, the plan for that will be to end it on. I think if I'm not mistaken, what I see, it ends on the 18th of April. So if I start on the 2nd, it will end on the 18th of April. So 75 days of solid power and work. Really looking forward to it. Um, like I said previously, I lasted 15 days in the last one. So fingers crossed this one is much better, but I think it will be. I'm pretty much sure, especially because I want to, you know, make sure I look good in cool clothes, especially gearing up to the um the festival season, which is definitely gonna happen around what the March time, especially here in the UK. So it's a good excuse to get myself right. So definitely gonna do that. So in case anyone was looking for updates and wondering, oh where was that um video he was he was going to upload? That's why it hasn't been uploaded <laughs> because I fell flat on my face. Absolute flat square on my face. But the first part of trying to fix something is obviously to admit it. And here I am admitting it to you with my uh with my full face, you know, with my full and utter face. But yeah, I hope you're aware of that regardless. Um, my weekend's been pretty uneventful. Loads of things have been happening, obviously, concerning my club. Loads of things have been happening in the world. So we're going to touch on a few of those things that I have pulled out for you on this jam-packed show. So let's just jump right into it. Number one thing I noticed or I saw on social was this post or this cover story courtesy of billboard featuring the one and only post malone who i've been a big fan of from the very first time he burst on the scene with obviously white Iverson, and i've kind of been championing him from afar and i think in terms of mega pop stars who have basically sold out or who have basically used the name of hip-hop black culture rap music to kind of propel their career and then decided eh, i don't want to do that anymore and jump to the other stuff he's probably the best advocate because i think he's done it I won't say the tasteful way, but he's done it in a somewhat authentic way, it feels like to me. It feels like to me, he always was interested in exploring other types of music, but he wasn't maybe as confident as he probably should have been. For whatever reason, he felt more confident doing R&B, hip hop esque music. And then through that, he was able to then use it as a gateway to do other things that he was maybe more interested in. Now he wants to become an all-round artist. And I think most people who do anything creative i think so again maybe i've been speaking for myself but i think most creative people don't want to be pigeonholed or most creative people are just waiting for somebody to give them an excuse or permission to do something that they probably haven't tried so it's no surprise most people that i know who are creative who end up doing you know those weekend group on pottery classes they fall in love with pottery because it's a creative you know feel that you can kind of you know do your thing at and maybe it's a thing that you didn't realize that you actually enjoyed until you actually had the chance to do it and that's what usually happens so imagine if you pigeonhole yourself and said oh no i only do watercolor oh i only do upholstery i only do um tapestry i only do this whatever you would never have been open to the idea that maybe you might like doing pottery so i'm i'm definitely sure that there are some artists that exist out there who just need a little bit of um a little bit of encouragement 
to make them or to help them along the way when it comes to exploring their musical range and i think post malone did that now i'm sure some people would say no he was more sinister than that he came in he profited off of black music and did whatever i say okay let's say if he did i don't think we can have both things we can't say black music or hip-hop is the number one genre in the world which it is in terms of cultural impact and how it affects you know many different facets of life and then we also then can't complain on the other side when people use that number one genre as a means to propel their career into the ways or into the paths that they want to go into that's just that's what it should be it should be used as a, as a launch pad for people's career so you can go back and say because you should have some people in hip-hop or people within black community or black culture should feel some level of pride that somebody that looks like that is able to come in feel comfortable feel welcomed take what they need to bruise their career and then kind of go out and do their own thing because you can always say yeah you came from our school you came from you know our foundation you came from um you know our little subsect of music genre that then exploded over the last few years it may be even more so when he was starting out to be honest but regardless i still think it's a win i don't think it's a bad thing and I think as well, generally as a person, I think he strikes me as a pretty decent human. Um, in terms of celebrities, he seems to be the one that's fairly normal or fairly well rounded. He doesn't seem to be a pain in the ass. He doesn't seem to, you know, he doesn't preach. That's the thing with me. When it comes to musicians and stuff, I'm usually okay with separating the art and the artist. I follow many controversial and very disliked artists in, you know, the you know the normal ways of looking at things. I don't necessarily care about what they say outside of music, but it does help when the artists that you follow aren't annoying anyway they say they're not annoying they say they're not trying to preach to you about something they're not trying to shield stupid products you know they're just they're not not desperate for attention at you know at every turn they just make the best product or the best music that they can they put it out to the fans they try and be as sincere as possible lay their heart out on it you know put basically have their heart on their sleeve uh bleed into the lyrics whatever it may be and then see, see what happens from there i'm okay with that i just hate when they get on their soapbox and start you know ranting and raving and telling us how to live our lives whilst they're living living in their gated community with navy seals at the top of their flipping walls ready to knock anybody out that jumps over it not for it but the thing that i wanted to bring this up about was seeing these shirts with post malone just made me feel a little bit it angered me slightly because I'm kind of fed up with these artists who pretend or act as if they're always getting on it and they're always high and they're always drunk when clearly they're not. Um, one proponent of this, I reckon, is Post Malone, another person who kind of um, does a little bit of, uh, uh, what do you think, does a bit of sessioning stolen valor is The weekend. Another one is The Future. These people are again I, I in each of their genres i reckon you look at post malone the weekend and future they're all very very successful artists in each of their genres they're people that a lot of people say are absolute animals in the in the studio people always say the weekend sorry or the future is able to turn around tracks or turn around ab albums or tapes really quickly and um, people say the weekend's a beast in the studio he stays in there for hours people say the same thing about post malone and i just think it's very unlikely knowing what i know about people who are creative and knowing what i know about people in that scene who actually do get on it who actually do have a problem with maybe excessive drinking and drugs that you could look the way that post malone does in the face right be this clear-eyed be this clear skin. Again, i know some magazine shoot don't kill me but still the way somebody looks in terms of their face especially with all these tattoos and stuff you can already see this person sleeps i'd say more than six hours a day drinks a bunch of water probably has a you know um probably has some avocado and toast in the morning you know maybe some what you call it what they have in a maybe some oatmeal or whatever it may be that's maybe a couple of push-ups this isn't somebody that gets on it all the time it's not always on xanax it's not sniffing a bunch of coke or doing a bunch of care i don't believe it and i don't know why they just keep a you know um posturing as if they are i understand in some way because i guess it's part of the overall appeal. It maybe is one of the reasons why I like him because I've lived that lifestyle. So maybe you can identify with somebody who kind of, you know, um, flirts and lets it be known that they might be into the things that you're into. But I think overall, in terms of sending a message to the kids, in terms of being able to say, hey, if you want to be the next person alone in whatever field that you're in, you need to kind of knuckle down and just do the work. You can't be every day outside, every day at flipping events, every day at after parties, every day at, you know, whatever it may be at raves and also get the work done. It just doesn't work that way. And you also can't, and you also won't end up looking at this. Like 
there are many artists within even the techno field who I can think of who are far older, far younger, or maybe in a couple of years older than Post Malone, and they don't look like this. They look terrible. So I don't believe for a second that he is as messed up day to day as he kind of purports to be in his songs or how he maybe acts on stage. Yes, you might like the old bevy here and there, but in terms of the hard stuff, I don't believe it because we see how that road ends. We've seen it with Juice World. We've seen to some extent with Excess Tentation. We've even seen it going on at the moment now with, um, with what's his name? Uh, Famous Dex who have supposedly went back into prison recently for violating some restraining order. We know what that looks like. We know um, that guy, John Gabbana, who's obviously now become um, sober and he's devoted his life to Christ. And he's, you know, weirdly enough, I saw a pose of him. He's supposedly going out of that girl, whoa, Vicky. They're, they're a couple now and going on, you know, basically from the looks of it quite seriously into each other. But we know how it ends. It usually doesn't end well if you're really on it, like Sonic. So I would just like to see a lot more honesty in that field when it comes to artists maybe sharing their journey and saying hey here's how i got to this level by you know maybe doing away with the la up after parties right like that famous kanye west song you know no more parties in la like that might be the thing that might be the vibe in order to get to this place you can't ever do anything else i don't think so and we haven't said the only recent example i can think of is obviously um what's his face um maybe lemmy is a good example maybe maybe lemmy Maybe the dude from Black Sabbath, another good example. Again, he's on death's door. I think there was supposed to be some article that came out about him a few months back or maybe a few, yeah, a few months ago, maybe a couple of years ago that basically said that he has a rare gene that basically allows him to drink and do as much drugs as he wants without maybe coming close to death. But still, he's still at the point now where I think, if I'm not mistaken, he had a stroke or something. He had to go off tour, right? The Black Sabbath guy, like... <sighs> You just can't. It's just not possible, especially nowadays too. Maybe back then when they were coming up, Keith Richards and that, you know, you read Keith Richards' book and there's so much alcohol and drug use, you, you're actually worried. I remember reading a lot of those books. I think, I think I've read a book about Liv Tyler. I read a book about um, Keith Richards. And I remember the first thing I did when I read those books was I should check if they were still alive because it didn't make any sense. But then if you think about it, um, when they were coming up, they were obviously coming up in a scene where those drugs were starting to get prominent, right? Um, you know, you think of, uh, what do you think? You think of what's that stuff they like to take in disco places, Studio 54? What's that thing called? Quaaludes. They had Quaaludes, they had heroin that was pure, Coke was coming up that was pure, but it was all untouched and it was all coming over by the bricks, right? By the ton. And, you know, people were having a good time, it was cheap, whatever it may be. But they were untouched nowadays with all the fentanyl and, the, and stuff. It just doesn't seem like a sensible idea to get on it like Sonic, especially at that age, going that hard with all the stuff that they tamper. No, take into account everything that's been added into it to tamper with it. I just don't think it's smart. And again, we've seen it how it ends. So I would like to to hear these artists, you know, go on some campaign where they stop the cap and maybe get a bit honest with their fans and say, hey, the reason why you're seeing me thriving and surviving and still being the way that I am is because I decided to hang up this party boy lifestyle and focus on the work, focus on this, focus on that, which is why you get good albums, which is why you get good music videos. This is why the tour looks amazing. Why I sound so good on stage. Like, you know, you've seen these live shows. You've seen Post Malone perform live. There's YouTube videos of him performing at, what is it, like Rolling Loud or something. And his voice sounds incredible. He sounds exactly like the CD. Like, I'm sorry, you can't do that if you're legitimately on it like he says he is. It just doesn't happen. So... Please stop the cap. Please stop the cap. Another thing I wanted to talk about on this was um, Postman had obviously in the same interview, he spoke about a lot of things going on in his life, what he's trying to, you know, in terms of maybe evolving and maybe retiring, which is odd to hear from an artist that big. But again, it goes to show you that maybe the music industry isn't what people make it out to be and the fact that he is an artist at that pinnacle of his level you can only imagine the demands that are put on him in terms of touring performing putting out music media obligations it probably gets too much so if he's able to make a crazy amount because especially nowadays i think a lot of people i think people accuse it's an unfair criticism that gets levied at a lot of young female rappers coming up now at the moment where people are like oh they're only rapping because they want to use it as an opportunity to get money they're not really passionate about the music of course they're not most people that make music aren't passionate about the music because if you're passionate about the music, you wouldn't want to stay in the music industry. You know what I mean? Because the music industry will break you. 
So you have to kind of be a little bit cold, a little bit calculated, um, a little bit career minded to make it work because the ones that are passionate and creative are the ones that are still playing in local bars, local community centers, doing kind of alternative tours, things that don't make you Drake money are the ones that are in love with the game still. But when you're at the top of the game, it's probably a double-edged sword because you can choose what you do, right? You can kind of move at your own sort of pace but you also have probably more people counting on you and depending on you than ever before that puts an unfair and an unbearable amount of burden on you. So you probably feel like, oh my God, you're the weight of the world on you, like expectation wise, because you don't want people to lose their way of life. You're giving people an opportunity to further their careers, to, you know, raise, to, to expand their families, to move abroad. I don't know, you've done so many things for people. You probably feel some, you, you, know, you definitely feel obligated to them and you just don't want to let them down, especially those people and of, of course your fans, especially if you care about them. So it's no surprise a lot of these people or a lot of these younger artists that are coming in who are popping really, you know, popping in a big way when they're you know before the age of 35 are deciding you know what maybe i don't want to be jay-z maybe i want to kind of retire earlier than that maybe early 40s maybe late 30s and use that money i was able to make because again you'd imagine if you're post Malone, you're not probably going to be able to make the same amount i want he probably still long term wise you obviously still make a lot of money but i mean in terms of making a sh a very high amount in a very short space of time music industry especially if you're at the top is the best way to do it you make a lot you go and you go and perform you do tours you get loads of you know the fees and that are crazy good you do placements um many other thing endorsements of course all this nft stuff's going on it can obviously make you a big bag if you don't really care about morals or ethics and then you could use that to then bounce to do the things you actually enjoy to do whether it's to open a restaurant a ranch set up something an agency whatever you then you could start putting your money into other things and then basically allowing your money to work for you but one of the things i thought was interesting was Obviously, this interview is maybe a way to him to kind of declare his intentions for the next five or so years. But Billboard couldn't help themselves to be messy and ask him a question about Travis Scott, which I don't think had anything to do with him at all. But again, they went to just, you know, for the clicks and the ratings. And then the second part of it was obviously him maybe detailing wanting to retire and do other things in, outside of music. So the first thing here, him commenting via, this is very the Billboard magazine, right? A cover story with Post Malone. It says the following, not being able to tour for so long slowed Post's creative process for the album, says Bell. The, the quote says as follows, that was always his biggest thing, him saying, I don't want to put out music if I can't tour and I don't want to be, to I don't want to be too old by the time I go on tour, which again, I think is a clear indication that the bigger artists clearly see especially when you're at that level, the only reason why they'd want to put out an album is to go on tour because obviously tours allow them, allow them to make crazy amounts of money. You think, you can only imagine how much, you know, the weekend tour that's maybe, that's happening, I think starting this year or maybe next year in North America, how much that's going to gross. It's going to be incredible, especially the amount of dates that they're doing. Bad Bunny's going on tour soon too. All these amazing artists, they want to put out albums consistently, but they also want to go on tour because that's the way you can recoup and make, you know, crazy amounts of money, especially if you go to different markets and do appearances and stuff. It just becomes obscene. It continues. It says, he has slowed, um, sorry, uh, he has slowly returned to the road on the festival circuit headlining Chicago's Lollapalooza in August. I think that's what I saw on YouTube and then day and night. So a day in Vegas in November after Travis Scott cancels his appearance following the death of 10 fans at his Astro World Festival the previous week. The quote says the follows. The promoters were pressuring us on Sunday, then Monday, and they needed an answer because it was next week, London recalls. I thought, you know what, maybe it will be a good break for him to go to Vegas, perform and again and fill in for Travis after a horrible situation then, then that we shouldn't wish for anyone. It was showing support for a fellow musician and for fellow outgoers, right? Quote, but that's not from him. Post is as follows. Post says he hasn't been in contact with Scott, with whom he has collaborated in the past, but adds that he's always really been in touch. He hasn't really been in touch with anyone outside of the inner circle these days. He says, I got a new phone and I have like 30 people in my contacts. A lot of my artist friends I haven't spoken to. Quaver, I haven't seen him forever. But whenever I see Quaver, I'm like, fuck dude, let's go. So much love. You really learn to appreciate those moments together even more. So clearly, you know, he's got told to distance himself from Travis Scott, which again must be just pick just for a moment. Think about how it must feel to be Travis Scott right now. One moment your phone is blaring and you're, you know, you can't every time you flip and turn your phone on or you flip it over, there's another notification. Somebody else trying to get something from you. Somebody just wants to do a deal with you. Somebody basically people trying to pull from you as much as possible or stand next to you so they can get a bit of your rub, a bit of your shine. 
And then suddenly in a matter of a couple of hours, your phone line is dead because you're now contaminated, you're toxic. It kind of reminds me of, I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but it's happened to me a couple of times. Whenever you get let go from a company, sometimes, you know, unfairly, you maybe have that thing where you're getting your stuff on the table and you're going to leave. And the people that used to sit around who, you know, you'd share so many, you know, um, personal stories with, you'd go out together at night, you maybe get some dinner, you might even go on a holiday together from time to time. These people you count as your friends, right? These colleagues, you get, you go to pick up your stuff and suddenly these people don't even want to look at you. You, you, you've become, you're like, you're like a leper. You know what I mean? And they, they just all kind of conveniently turn away and let you pack your stuff away on your own. Maybe one person stands up and helps you, but for the most part, they just leave you alone because you've been marked with the with the with the cross. You know what I mean? You've got the you got the um, yeah, you got the mark on you. So no one wants to come near you because they don't want to be contaminated too. That's what it kind of feels like. And I can only imagine it being probably far more brutal in Hollywood or in the entertainment industry because a lot of your value is on how much of a star you can be and how much you can be of help or of assistance to other people right you need to get basically clout that's what you're in it for and the more clout you have the more access you have to people the more earning potential you have and just you know the more you basically get to fill your ego um and basically get to kind of uh, scratch that itch out of your back in terms of wanting to be very very well known and then to go from that to go to pure silence no more dms no more unsolicited calls no more crazy emails proposing you to invest in a restaurant in some flipping helicopter pad in the middle of Dubai, like none of those craziness, just you on your own, you you and your actual team, your actual friends who legit care about you and that's it. That must be absolutely brutal. I can only imagine how that must feel. I really, really can't imagine how that must feel. Um, and obviously with Post Malone, he just has to protect himself in that regard, but it also kind of echoes something he must have said about Ethan Klein in it from H3H3, who was moaning and bitching on these podcasts that, you know, post came on their show a couple of times did that hollywood thing where he basically pretended he was their friend and then essentially ghosted them and hasn't returned their texts or calls because clearly he was changing his phone on purpose because again i'm that person as well that's why i kind of maybe relate to post malone's personality a lot because i'm similar in that way like if i want to talk to you i will if i don't then i won't so the fact that he says he changes his phone is probably his way of basically letting people know subliminally that hey i'm moving because I mentioned it a few times on here too, and it like people breaking up with you as friends is horrible. It's brutal. It really is the worst thing in the world. And maybe it's for the best when people like I've kind of changed my mind on it. I really, really have when it comes to ghosting. I was one person that didn't that hated ghosting. I thought it was really, you know, it's I won't say cruel. It just lacked common decency. Like if somebody, if you're kind of in contact with somebody and you're arranging to meet or your friends or whatever it may be you owe them and you kind of decided to do something together you owe them either a heads up that you're not going to do it an explanation an apology or but some sort of, but but whatever is some sort of communication you don't just stop talking to the person and ignore them i've done it myself again i'm not talking from a point of you know being the perfect human being i've done it myself and i've suffered greatly for it in terms of consequences um to the point where a couple of these relationships are basically unrepairable maybe one can be repaired to a certain extent but most of them are basically done because i decided to you know to be like the the um the mysterious guy the disappearer that i don't have friends thing you know the same boring stuff i talk about myself all the time but in actuality ghosting people I thought at that time wasn't really nice to do. But I've also come around to the thinking that sometimes in life, not doing a nice thing is actually the best thing. Because what would you rather? Would you rather somebody legitimately tell you why they don't want to hang out with you for real? Like, do you really want to know? I don't think people do want to know. Like, if, you're, if you've got a work colleague, I've had it happen to me mostly at work. There's usually a person that you work with, boy or girl, it doesn't matter who it is, who can't handle the liquor. They're not really good with their drinks. They're not really good around people the opposite sex who they're into or whoever they're into. They get a little bit larry, they get a bit touchy, they get a bit handsy. They do that thing where they maybe talk to security guards that like they want to fight them. They maybe pester bartenders. They got just an annoying trait about them that makes them a nightmare to go out with. That person doesn't really want to know why you all keep avoiding them on a Friday night or a Thursday after work. They don't really want to know. They kind of want to be in a state of kind of ambivalence. So I'm putting them, naivete. They kind of just, they kind of want to live in fa in like a fairyland somewhere. They want to have their head in the clouds as to why you're not inviting them out. Deep down, they know why, but they don't actually want to know why. 
So I think sometimes as people ghost you, it's like a it's like a humane way and a kind way to basically let you know this ain't gonna work out. And it's probably for the best because you don't really want to know what they actually think. Because when you find out what they actually think, you might not want to get out of bed for the next seven days. You know what I mean? It probably might ruin your entire year, right? It might maybe harm your entire way of basically making friends. Like I've mentioned before in the podcast, no, I mentioned before in the video talking about <clears throat> the Brian Cannon and Brendan Shaw thing and all the Chris Lear stuff. I mentioned part of the reason why it triggered me so much is because I had a very traumatic you know, experience with some friends growing up where basically I had this group of friends who I thought were my friends when I was growing up in a little area I used to live in. And then because this cooler kid came in to live in our neighborhood, suddenly my group of friends basically ditched me and hanged out with the other kid because he was cooler, which he probably was. His parents let him come out more. They let the other kids go around his house. You know, African parents, they're not letting you come in anywhere. Um, you know, whatever. His, his house had wood flooring. Remember back that being a thing back in the old younger like your house having wood flooring, his fridge was full of Coca Colas and shit. Mine was just full of those kind of off brand cola bottles that you'd get from like little that were like two liters and they taste like shit after you open them. <laughs> so clearly they ditched me. And then I remember one day I went to go and try to hang out with them. No, I was trying to find them and they kept running away or not running away. Like they'd, they'd keep saying I'm, they're over here and they wouldn't be over there, they'll be over somewhere else. And then finally I found them. I tried to like hang out with them and they basically said, go away, Zingo, we don't want to be your friend anymore. And that one occasion is basically what led me to be this guy that rants into a camera or into a microphone on my own <laughs> all these years later. As dumb as that story is, that legitimately might be the genesis as to why, although I'm quite personable and quite an extrovert, I'm also quite introverted and I don't like to hang out with people at all. I try to basically keep myself to myself, which is basically a defense mechanism to not be hurt. But if they would have ghosted me back then and just pretended or no, or just left me alone and just ignored me, I would have got the message and it would have been less brutal. And I would have been in denial as to why they didn't want to be my friend, but at least <laughs> it wouldn't have hurt me this way. <laughs> so I think maybe ghosting is a good thing. It really might be a, a slight good thing to get ghosted because it's their way of letting you know, Hey, in a somewhat subtle, humane, kind, um, looking after your feelings way, this ain't gonna work out let's just leave it the same thing same thing can be said for job interviews do you want a job interview to really write you a one page as to why you didn't get the job do you really want them to do that to tell you when you came in you were sweating too much that meant you were running that meant you were late to tell you that maybe you didn't answer the question correctly that maybe tell you that you didn't know what the question really was you didn't you know understand it grammatically to tell you your experience was terrible to tell you they only sat you down to interview you because they felt sorry for you. Do you really want to know the truth? No, you don't. You don't want to know the truth. <laughs> Just pretend like, you know, they'll pretend like you, you didn't send the email. You'll pretend like they didn't re read it or you make up a story that they're racist, whatever it may be. It'll help. It'll let you sleep well at night. And then the next day you can apply again. That's probably, probably the best way to go about things because when people get really honest, it can really hurt your feelings. So ghosting might be one of the good things in life i have to agree i have to just put that out there but you know maybe i'm maybe i'm being dumb maybe i'm being dumb next we have to talk about this of course this is courtesy of tmz this is all over the timeline or probably late on this rihanna and asap rocky are pregnant with their first child so congratulations to them congratulations to the decision order um it's pretty wild to see so many people over the pandemic either break up hook up or get pregnant there's been nothing else in between because I guess we've had nothing else to do but to, you know, stick near to the people that we love, which is even revealed that they're not for us, that they're definitely for us. Oh, that person's quite cool. You know what I mean, that's basically what's happening in this regard. Um, I have to, from just a visual standpoint, because I don't care about relationship too much, because again, because I'm a dude, getting onto that, oh, who is who, and I don't care. But in terms of just a visual standpoint, there's no denying they make a great couple. There's no denying that they complement each other really well in terms of them, you know, being obsessed with fashion and stunting and looking great whenever they walk out of their apartments. Um, can you just imagine how nice their apartments are in New York? Oof. Um, so they look amazing. And also I like the fact that the pictures aren't convoluted. It's not overdone. One of the things that I hate and I think I've slowly started to come around to because you know it's not really my place to speak and who gives a shit what i have to say but for the longest time it used to really annoy me all these kind of gender reveal things and it's just these weird announcements when it comes to pregnancy because for me it's like yeah this is a normal human thing 
you know, women can get pregnant. It's not like an achievement. It's not an achievement. It's not something to make into a ceremony. It just didn't make any sense. This new Western thing where the, just the getting pregnant was the big deal and it was made into a big thing and photo shoots just seemed really tacky and lame. But over the years, again, my heart has softened. I've started to understand, you know, various women go through different complications. Some people can't give birth very easily or they can't get pregnant or they just go through different things in life. And again, it is a pretty marvelous and far out thing to have a literal human growing inside of you, right? Com you know, conceptually, it's hard to kind of get your head wrapped around it. So, that, of course, go celebrate it. But sometimes the overdone ones can get a little bit puke worthy, especially considering th the bar is so high with the Beyonce's and Nicki Minaj's and whoever else out there who done really good ones right it's just so high that when you start to do them on your level it can just look a bit lame a little bit too try hard so i like that they've done this really i won't say gritty but this kind of everyday way of doing it right under a bridge somewhere in the middle of new york i don't know that's brooklyn i don't know what neighborhood it is both looking amazing obviously rana's outfit i think obviously trump's um asap rocky she's got the vintage chanel one just looking great so that you could definitely say it's definitely amazing um it's funny to see people online especially boys bemoaning and crying and saying oh she got pregnant i can't believe she let me down or she you know she cheated on me it's like guy come on guy let's let's be real you know what i mean let's be real you you never had a shot do you know what i mean if she if this girl was willing to dump the likes of drake chris brown before asap rocky and choosing because again i think a lot of people are saying oh that shock he's the one that got chose but still think she had options she had many options before him there was this billionaire guy from the middle east like she you know this is rihanna man her inbox is healthy so to go from that you know to, to let go of those two guys or to decide i'm not i'm not going to get with those guys and they maybe aren't long-term um partners for various reasons and then decide to go to asap rocky this is goes to show that she has options she clearly, you know, they clearly have a connection that not many people really understand. And again, more power to them, innit? Wish them nothing but the best. Uh, but again, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the shoot. I think it's done very well. Um, Rihanna might have the most photogenic face that exists out there. Um, she looks amazing in clothes. That needs to be said also. And she's probably had some of the best uh, pregnancy looks as well this entire time, wearing loads of Vetamar, loads of Balenciaga, which is always boxy and covers up baby bumps. So this whole time that she was gallivanting around New York, taking great pictures, it was clear that she was pregnant at that time. So that's amazing to see. And obviously a look back at, you know, their first sort of collaboration together, Fashion Killer, which was absolutely amazing. Maybe the time that they kind of hooked up and, you know, got together for the first time, maybe, who knows? um yeah love everything about it love everything about it i think it's going to be cool um evolution's coming you know little by little we kind of we kind of all grew up with i think yeah for the most part we all kind of grew up with rocky maybe not rihanna maybe more rocky more so so to see him go from being the guy that used to wear mighty healthy you no know, um what was that brand called on oh, my healthy what's a brand called mishka was it mishka right to go from the guy wearing mishka with asap mob jumping into crowds fighting people to go to that fake beef with Tyler, making up with Tyler, then becoming best friends with him, then evolving into what he is now, Iggy Azalea phase, Kylie Jen Kendall, Kendall Jenner phase, then this, it's pretty cool. It's pretty sick, I'm not going to lie. I mean, he kind of growing up in front of our eyes, so it's cool to see, but also it's another reminder of how old we're all getting when these people are getting together and deciding to make a family. It's pretty, pretty wild. So yeah, congrats to them. It looks great. It also got me onto thinking about the criticism that ASAP Rocky got around his comments regarding Black Lives Matter because I think under some of the comments, again, I think Twitter's a bit, Twitter's good. Twitter's good for uh, for wasting time. I think if you want something, if you want um, if you want to enjoy content, hmm, yeah, I think if you want to enjoy content on the on the toilet or when you're bored on a train somewhere, I don't think. I think Twitter and TikTok are kind of one and two. Instagram is a bit shit overall, but I think the way the algorithm works and the feed works on both Twitter and TikTok make them really good places to have a bit of a time sink where you can waste hours and hours and hours just consuming content. So when the announcement happened, when the post went live of, you know, uh, Rihanna being pregnant, I was reading through the comments and there was loads of people talking about, oh yeah, uh, Mr. Brook is a colorist. He doesn't support Black Lives Matter. I was like, what? I don't remember any of this. So obviously I did a bit of a Google and this article from the guardian came up five years old article that says, Asap Rocky criticizes Black Lives Matter, quote unquote, bandwagon. And if you're looking at it at the time, it obviously was a bit insensitive considering what was going on. But now with hindsight, well, now with hindsight, 
um, and since time has elapsed, his comments don't seem that crazy. They obviously were crazy at the time because people's emotions are red hot. But in terms of what we've seen so far and what's transpired, Black Lives Matter organization, you know, people are running it, stealing loads of money, investing money to buy homes, like just being very shady people. It definitely goes to show that maybe standing or maybe speaking for yourself and actually having the courage or the conviction to stay, stand up and basically say something, especially if it's going to be something that's going to be deemed and not not unfashionable but you know it's not gonna be the thing that everyone wants to hear at the moment it's maybe a better thing in terms of you falling on the right side of history people say on the internet than just kind of going along with the chorus of whatever else is saying out there in social media because people just seem to kind of repeat the same thing just for the sake of it and this whole oh, he's a color he's not black lives matter stuff is just nonsense so we're just going to go through a few bits of it so it says here this is his comment so uh da -da -da. Issa Rockets attempted to clear the air following a re-emergence of a controversial interview, but may have created far more problems than for himself. Earlier this week, a 2015 interview with Time Out New York resurfaced, in which rap star appeared to be unconcerned about police violence in the summer African American. Oh, he said the following, I don't want to talk about no fucking Ferguson and shit because I don't live over there. I live in fucking Soho and Beverly Hills. I can't relate. So, of course, saying you can't relate to people that look like you being beaten and brutalized by police is a bit wild but the sentiment does make sense because it's one one thing that i kind of have never really understood this kind of press or this desire for some people to step out and always comment on everything that they see especially stuff that they see concerning people that look like them because i think it's just a it definitely is a western thing where for whatever reason we think just because we share the same skin color that we have the shared experiences when that is could be that could be further from the truth especially in europe there are people in europe especially black people that look like myself who have absolutely nothing in common with me because they you know they decide to identify with another part of their community that they live in whether it's the indigenous white people or whatever it may be or just their upbringing is completely different so to suggest that we have a shared experience because we look like each other is completely ridiculous um and it probably is for the best if sometimes if you don't know what you're talking about to just say i don't want to talk about it because i don't know what i'm talking about and i live over here then to step out and try and <clears throat> comment on the struggles of people living in poverty in africa in in parts of north america especially people of african um, descent and try and make some sort of eye-opening remark about it when you're legitimately in some soho flat somewhere surrounded by 17 caucasian women willing to suck you off it just isn't going to hit the same so you might as well just keep your mouth closed, lace up your Jeremy Scotts and keep it moving because why not? You've got nothing else to lend to the conversation. And usually in these occasions, especially when it comes to Ferguson, especially when it comes to George Floyd protests, the people that need to speak, the people who've basically been put on this earth to, um, uh, who've been put on this earth to basically occupy those positions and be the lightning where people need to see, be the leader, be the one that kind of sparks the conversation, rallies the troops, they're going to respond. They don't need you to pop up and take off your flipping Star Trek trucker hat and join in. They already got it sorted. They don't need more distraction. So it's probably for the best that you just stay out of it. But these days, people just want clout. They want they want to be part of the conversation. They just want to take part of just for the sake of taking part. I remember when that whole Black Squares nonsense was happening. A couple of people DM'd me on, on Instagram and stuff and were like, oh, um, I see you haven't posted anything. I just want to find out what, what you think about this because I feel like I'm being pressured and, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm a seller is that, or like I'm a coon or I was like, what? A coon? Because you're not posting a black fucking square on your social media profile. That's going to do what? Everyone that posted a black social, a black square on their social media profile, what's changed in the music industry? What's any, is anything different that's happened since then? You have, you know, Neil Young flipping arguing or basically deciding to remove all these music from Spotify because he doesn't like what Joe Rogan says. The whites are fighting each other on that platform. Are we getting anything from it? There are many techno artists are taking their music off of it because they're not getting like what changed really? Nothing changed from that whole situation. So again, if if you're if something in you compels you to do something like that, go ahead and do it. But if you're just doing it to be a part of the conversation or because you feel like your skin colour didn't you know dictates how you move and what you say you've already lost because that's not going to be anything meaningful it's not going to actually provide any change it's just going to be more noise for the sake of noise and um, it continues says uh da, 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 with his remarks again being discussed and condemned rocky granted a long interview to new york hip-hop radio show the breakfast club after saying his remarks had been misquoted and he had been mourning asap yams at the time i had spoken to the magazine he says as follows 
again i don't like that sort of stuff if you're gonna if you're gonna say controversial things stand on it don't then try and you know um bring up the you know very tragic passing of one of your close friends who was very beloved in the community to try and take the heat off you a little bit that's a little bit lame i don't like that just stand on the courage of your convictions wherever the chips may fall it is what it is and it continues it says as follows it says i just get upset and i was really trying to, and i was really trying to say there was like yo i just i just hate when your bandwagon stuff start i agree with him i mean how come you know black lives matter when the police take them when a police officer takes it and it should and and it should be like black lives it should matter when their black life takes it you know what i mean it should always matter all lives matter which is another crazy thing to say right after saying he doesn't care <laughs> he, he came out with some mad quotes right <laughs> um i don't want to talk about ferguson because <laughs> i don't live over there i live in fucking soho and beverly hills and then the end of this line saying all lives matter like <laughs> he's on the mad one but also i appreciate it. i appreciate somebody of his stature of his you know notoriety coming out and saying these things because at the end there's some truth to it especially when you take into context that if i'm not mistaken asap rocky's older brother passed away because of gang violence i'm pretty sure maybe i'm not mistaken but if that's the case and he holds some resentment to the people that his brother was hanging around with and rolling with who most likely maybe were responsible in some way shape or shape or form for his passing or maybe with the culture that surrounds the street life where you can't snitch and you can't talk about who killed who because you're going to be ostracized by the community whatever who knows what the reason is but he's definitely got some skin in the game because he's lost a member of his own family to gun violence or to some sort of violence on the streets whatever it may be so i can definitely see where he's coming from in that regard and then the other comment that people were really pissed off about him was supposedly um asa rocky being a colorist no no he cut so he clarified again sorry this is what i was gonna say he clarified his comments again via this interview that he did with um kerwin frost on his show Kerwin talks which i thought was i still think is really one of the best ones on youtube especially when it comes to interviewing people within my little cultural sphere that i enjoy and i think he speaks quite well about the whole thing and how it basically how his arrest in sweden added to his ability to maybe see where he might have come wrong where he met where his comments might have been interpreted the wrong way in terms of them being not lacking any sort of sympathy or empathy of people's position but it also kind of reinforces the idea that no i'm what i said was right and if you actually want to be about anything change wise you need to do the work you can't just be posturing and just saying stuff for the sake of fake or sake of saying it and you're not doing anything because then that's being fake but most people in this world are fake so you know he has a bit of a conundrum in that regard but this is um asap rocky talking, talking to kerwin frost about what he learned from his experience being in that swedish jail it go to show that you know it can happen to anybody and yeah. you know that whole experience more so than never it kind of just you know had me in jail thinking like am i was i wrong right damn maybe i am wrong damn maybe it is my fault like you be in solitary confinement right, so right, long right. no windows and nothing did you have lights so, to you could have like you could put lights okay, on okay. but the, it was it was um daytime Right. 22 hours of the day oh okay in oh. sweden so it's oh. only night for two hours so wow. you're depressed you seeing yeah, yeah, light all day, fucking like, all day, day yeah. all day bro damn okay i hated the light yeah yeah you know what i'm saying i wish i could have slept all day you gotta right. really stick you through that shit yeah. like on some mental institution shit but basically motherfuckers is on some shit like making me feel like i'm wrong or you know and i didn't want to feel sorry for myself or play a victim or whatever you weren't wrong yeah you know i know and so i'm on the news and then i'm speaking back to people and they like yo you know the states everybody going crazy the president uh uh and then you got people on you know black twitter they brung up some shit that you said and yeah. da, 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 like saying you don't really care about the hood and shit like that you know and i i thought i addressed that before yeah, in the past yeah. and just to be in jail hearing people still trying to stir up some weird right. shit then having a nigga then i'm hearing like yo charlemagne came to your defense right right you know what i'm saying the person who would who would advocate you down, what they say, yeah, yeah you know what i'm saying like 100%. he literally was just like yo y'all gotta have a mind of your own sometimes yeah. and y'all gotta stop yeah. trying to perpetuate whack fake this shit cancel culture is out you of get, mind you get yeah. what i'm saying yeah. but what i will say is though you know what i'm saying from from everything those old interviews i used to say shit like yo bro i think that it's inappropriate for me to rap about certain shit that I didn't help with. I felt like when it came to Ferguson, J. Cole went down and he he actually was on the news and he actually helped. He I felt like he deserved to rap about that. Yeah. He deserved to say something about right, that. Right. So when somebody asked me that, you know, I get the the in 2015 I was just like 
I just feel like personally, if right. I'm in Soho or yeah. I'm here, well, I can't even talk on that. Like that right, ain't right. right. That's right. in a That's that's like you know what I'm saying. Yeah. That's that's like appropriating. Yeah. And that's what everybody do. Right. That's like seeing a homeless person on the on the street whipping your camera out, giving them food. You want it to be genuine. It's when not you're saying it. It's it's just pretentious. It's like you telling your fans to believe in themselves when that's what? not even what you would say, say to your homies. So you get yeah, what I'm no, saying? No. It's just some fake shit just to say yeah, it, just, just to do it. just yeah. cause yep. for the sake yep. of seeming like a certain type of person. Yeah. And. The only thing I, I feel like I still I'm still not wrong for that. The only part that I was wrong at was that when in my case, yeah, there was people that never been to Sweden. Yeah. There's people that never been to Harlem. Mm. There's people that don't know ASAP Rocky, mm -hmm. but still was empathetic or sympathetic to my situation yeah, and had true. empathy and could understand and was vocal and yeah. helped my situation. Yeah. So I was wrong, you know, and that, and being in the cell thinking about that, like, you know, like. Of all things, you know. You as a man, like openly saying that now, yeah. is like a crazy big step. Bro, but I've been saying this for the past four years, yeah. but more so than ever, mm. I experienced something to where mm. the shoe was all the way on the yeah. other foot, you did? Yeah. Like, to where it's just like, yeah, I wasn't wrong for what I said, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you know, I had people misconstruing it, and I had people. You weren't wrong when you said it the first time, it was just like, the way that it, it was, wasn't yeah, explained and, correctly. You know, yeah. But yeah, you get the drift in it. So I think it was perfectly fine what he said. Don't really see anything wrong in it. I think people are overreacting as per usual. Um, again, it's just funny to see in in an event where you he's meant to be getting some sort of flowers and praise for maybe maturity and deciding to kind of grow, you know, as a person, start a family. It should be a point when people would be looking at thinking, yeah, man, he's grown up, he's been, you know, he's doing the right thing. One of the horrible parts about being somewhat of, famous is that when you start doing right or start going the right way or start maybe evolving and changing people just can't let go of the things that you did or said in the past and they keep bringing them up again i don't know if that's their way of basically comforting themselves because you know most people are unable to change in any meaningful way let alone a tiny way so maybe when they see you making some effort to evolve they want to keep reminding you that you ain't shit by showing you stuff that you said or repeating the things that you said in an effort for you to snap to then revert back to how you always were and then they can say aha i told you he was a fake maybe that's the thing i don't know if that is but i thought it was really odd rihanna gets pretty it, it felt like rihanna was pregnant and he was just happened to be along for the ride i saw some people even cropping out him on pictures and stuff thinking people on social media are weird man like i don't know i don't know what people want it's like they want to dictate rihanna who she should date like I, I don't get it i think it's all bizarre but hey happy for him and happy that he's able to kind of grow somewhat from the whole entire experience but the last one i've just commented on that one all these comments regarding the colorism thing that was a mad one when it comes to the girls wearing lipstick i remember the time when you said it i got the sentiment but as a dude you just can't say these things in it so just end it at this and then we move on <laughs> He said the following, he said, but for real, for me, I feel like, well, this is, this is in 2013 too, but you know, this is not it's a long, long time ago. As you can see, he was very, very young back then. And but he used to wear his braids like that back in the day with his head snapped back, right? He said, but for real, for me, I feel like with the red lipstick thing, it all depends on a pair of complexion. I'm just being for real. You have to be fair skinned to get away with that. Just like if you were to, if you were like fucking, for instance, what do dark skinned girls have? that you know fair-skinned girls can't do purple lipsticks no nah, that looks stupid on all girls purple lipstick guys like what the fuck <sighs> yo you know again i've learned my lesson trying to comment on women things you just can't you just have to stay out of women's business he learned his lesson he's he's now dating or have, about to have a child with a woman who's basically the pinnacle of woman's business she made woman's business her business so i'm sure he'll be all right i'm sure he'll be completely fine um what else you talk about here oh let's move this talk about this actually let's move this over there um we'll talk about this oh yeah let's talk about this this, this. so obviously over paris fashion week i remember I, I can't believe i didn't mention this beforehand but um nigo debuted his first collection with kenzo um i was over the moon when the news got announced like i said before i've been a huge baby nape and nigo fan from the very beginning probably one of my first brands i bought within the streetwear within streetwear maybe maybe it might be the first one maybe bape supreme and hundreds which is a weird combo in it if you think about it but um those were maybe the first brands that i bought with my own hard-earned money from reselling shoes um back in the day and i fell in love with japanese culture i fell in love with that whole tokyo scene um nigo jun takashi 
um, Hiroshi Fujiwara, um, Tetsu from W Taps, Shin from Neighborhood. All these people were basically my idols and people I basically looked up to and thought, you know what, I want to be you. And then also like the idea or the kind of importance they placed on retail stores. That was back in the day when I used to go to retail stores like Hideout, um, Busy Workshop, Slam City Skates, um, Slamming Kicks. What was another one we used to go to? Uh, I forgot the other one it was called For Patrol. All these stores in London that were absolutely popping and doing great things, and you wanted to work there. You wanted to kind of take part in a culture because that was where all the kind of events went on. People would kind of come to you to let you get on lists and stuff. You might get little deals, do swap deals with people who worked in other stores. I got I got to have my little time in the sun working, obviously, at 1948, the really cool store they had in Shoreditch back in the day when it first opened. So that was pretty great. But that was basically my introduction into everything that I'm into now through treat wearing through those early kind of magazines I used to kind of read. Like I got a couple here. These kind of magazines I used to collect all the time, right? These old school Japanese magazine, like huge. I've got another one here too, huge with undercover on it. This has got um Hiroshi Fujiwara on the front too. Loads of old school kind of um ads featuring old babe and stuff I think might be in here. They've got the Colette store feature where I think I've got a babe editorial here that I can show you. Old school, got Hiroshi wearing cool stuff. Nope, nope, nope. Maybe not here. Maybe it's in this one. Let me see if I've got it. Anything concerning babe in here? Nope, nope. Truck. But this punk, yeah, there you go. See, got old school babe from back in the day. This is when, where is magazine? This is 2003. So you've got old school babe there. Look at that. Look how cool that looks. That looks great, isn't it? You got flannel shirts there. Let's see if you can see it on the screen. Let's get you see this here on the screen. Should be able to, right? You got flannel shirts there. Star hoodies. So this is stuff that I was into. This was me back in the day. So I flipping loved all that. So when I saw the news of Nigo going to Kenzo, for me it felt like a um a great way to kind of remind everybody or a great way to kind of signal that streetwear had definitely taken over fashion right in terms of menswear especially that that whole aesthetic that whole sensibility taste level application um you know interest whatever it may be the ability to kind of tap into the cultural zeitgeist the ability to kind of have kids especially who are coming up doing cool things themselves in the palm of your hands um whatever kind of trends were being set there were basically infiltrating other parts of fashion when it comes to sneakers hoodies t-shirts you know logo designs whatever all of it has come from street when i'm really kind of proud in a way to be part of that community and have that kind of culture be so prominent prominent now in you know in society whether it comes to reselling shoes nfts street art it's all flipping from that bedrock right from that foundation of street where i feel like in my opinion again maybe i'm being too um thinking about it but i'll never stop kind of you know signal boosting that because as much as i love fashion i still have to admit like you know i'm still an outsider i'm still somebody that people would look like oh he doesn't necessarily fit the criteria of somebody that would be into sort of stuff didn't go to the right school but but, 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 but all this sort of nonsense right but I still think the school of streetwear is the best school, especially if you want to make it in fashion nowadays. You only have to look at the people that got recently applied, recently hired at these houses. You know, Virgil Abloh, of course, at Louis Vuitton RIP. Um, no conventional, traditional kind of fashion experience. You got Rugi from obviously um, from Rude. Recently got his appointment at Bali. You've got, of course, Matthew Williams at Givenchy. You know, you've got Heron Preston doing his thing. Supposedly there are rumors about him maybe going to a big house really soon. So all these people are able to basically take that sensibility and that taste level from streetwear and apply it to the highest echelons of fashion with a capital F. And I've always thought Nigo was somebody that should be tapped in in that regard, especially when you see the early stuff he used to put out with Human Made, the level of care and attention that goes into this kind of things, like the amount of work that goes into one t-shirt, the amount of work that goes into a graphic, the amount of work that goes into a, you know, a snap front closure, a zip pocket, um, you know, the the flipping length of a trouser all of it is really considered and you take that same attention to detail and you apply it to a fashion house you're going to absolutely smash it so in a, in a way i had no doubt it was going to be good 
but when it went down the runway and it looked incredible i was really happy i was like oh my god thank god because it would have been the worst thing in the world to see somebody as prominent and as well respected as nigo bring out a trash collection and people be ragging on him because it would have kind of again been a bit a bad smudge on streetwear and all the people out there the kind of vanessa friedman's and all those kind of wild lads who are kind of doing those kind of weird um cultural dog whistling things where they're like oh the return of tailoring which basically is their way of saying we don't want people like you in this thing we want tailoring to come back so that we can get all our snotty fashion people who don't sell stuff who don't connect with youth who don't connect with customers on the actual sales floor to come back to prominence so that we can wank over them again and not buy their stuff that's the problem as well with these fashion critics they talk about all this stuff that they want to see on runways but they don't even buy it themselves they don't buy it i mean they get stuff on flipping um they get stuff on heavily discounted uh what you call it all the sheets that they kind of put in or maybe they get stuff sent or comped but they don't actually go and buy things in retail stores they don't take pride in being a shopper in being a fan it's all just theorizing nonsense so it was great to see nigo step out onto that runway and actually deliver in a big way and i'm going to show you the collection now so it's courtesy of vogue runway <clears throat> i thought the entire thing looked incredible it looked really well really well done really well considered um he went through with major staples and just kind of basically added his little sprinkling and stardust on top of it nothing too crazy and you can't go wrong with it i thought this denim set looked great i saw some people commenting that supposedly this was a rip on what denim tears had done previously but supposedly this print was taken from the archive and then applied on this suit i'm sure there was maybe a little bit of head nod to denim tears because maybe they're friends in the scene and stuff i'm pretty sure but to say that you know nigo was copying somebody who just started making clothes in the last five years is ridiculous especially when you consider that he and hiroshi fujiwara basically invented everything that we hold dear from the little tabs that you have on your sleeve of your t-shirt to the way hoodies are cut to putting diamond tees on stuff like they popularized or basically invented everything that we basically hold dear in street right now so to suggest that they were copying was just ridiculous but i see where people are coming from but you know no um we continue just everything looked great in terms of it obviously looked great on men but these little cute looks on women too were a great sign that he definitely has the eye and somebody is able to make cool products because you have to remember when nico's at his pomp and he had the babe cafes and the stores all over flipping tokyo and other parts of japan like he was designing every single part of those places of course in collaboration with um i forgot the interior design firm that he used to use you know amazing spaces that he create i think even the busy workshop in london that was such a small space but it made it feel so spacious but he he was basically responsible for being there like he would seek approval or he'd basically approve everything that got done and he's and at his brand so it's no it's no surprise that somebody that has that kind of eye it has that kind of dedication would also be able to apply that in the fashion sense if anything he's basically street where it's Karl Lagerfeld in a weird way and if you think about it especially when you think about output the amount of projects he's done um I'm sure he's done many things behind the scenes without putting his name to it as well but yeah the entire thing is just so so fantastic man really really well done um I love everything about it the prince and again this is going to be one of those great appointments because what Kenzo wanted is what the same thing for Givenchy want they want relevancy yes it's good that the clothes are amazing but they want relevancy they want people like myself to be talking about it they want people that are way more prominent than i am to be speaking about it they want it to be covered for basically because it's nigo he's guaranteed or they guarantee themselves coverage on every single major streetwear sneaker adjacent site that exists especially if you make something really desirable like a hat or like some trainers or a hoodie you guaranteed yourself that coverage so you get that for free and on top of that you get the ability to see some stuff to people in the scene the gunner was there i think kanye west was there um tyler the creator was there who's obviously going to wear a lot of the stuff like all the people that you, you would assume that would be into the kind of thing he's into were obviously there as well so it made complete sense um why they got him in charge and again the, the benefit of hiring these people is that number one but people i say from streetwear number one for the most part unless they're terrible or they get stage fright or they start indulging in drugs and prostitutes most likely they're always going to do well they're going to do a good job so they're going to do a good job and they're going to make sure you get clicks and they're going to make sure you get engagement they're going to make sure you increase your followers all these things that these brands and these conglomerates and these corporations care about too the bottom line and the ability to get social media gathering basically they want everything when they hire you they want you to sell stuff they want you to appeal to a younger audience um they want you to create cool cultural experiences or whatever it may be um they want you you know 
events track I suppose be is a album Nigo's putting out called I Know Nigo or something. Like all these cool things are gonna be like, oh, yeah, look at the varsity jackets. Oh. All these things are gonna be um little assets or little things that are going to add and propel Kenzo into being somewhat culturally relevant in a way that they weren't previously before. So it's definitely a step in the right direction. I love this interpretation of the what's that hat called from Vivian Westwood? It looks like it, right? It's basically a woolly hat, but it's made in a shape similar to that wood Vivian Westwood hat that Pharrell was wearing back in the day. Because again, um, Nigo's obsessed with that whole era. So is Hiroshi Fujiwara. So it's no surprise him giving a head nod to that. And the beret as well feels like a um a bit of a head nod as well to the Sex Pistols and all that kind of era. But again, this is just all so well done. It really is really, really well done. I love the entirety of the collection. It's all going to sell really well. It's going to be worn by tons of people. And, you know, it's another confirmation. If ever, look at that suit, man. You can see Tyler in that suit all day long in it. If ever you need confirmation, again, look at this jacket. If ever you need confirmation of streetwear, it was the number one um, field, especially if you want to make it in fashion, especially for menswear. This is it. This is the confirmation you needed. So big up, um, Nigo. Just a bit bittersweet that Vir 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 sorry, Virgil wasn't around to see this because as great as Nigo is, there's no denying that Virgil also helped to kind of... Um, I would say bring him back to some, maybe kind of remind people how important he was by doing that cal capsule compilation he did with him, capsule collection he did with him at Louis Vuitton. So it's a bit sad that he wasn't able to see what he was able to kind of contribute to in some I meaningful way. I'm sure he was obviously aware because these conversations happen, you know, a long way out. He probably got interviewed for the role too. So maybe he was aware he was in talks, but it would have been nice to see you know him be able to see oh wow you know i contribute something to be able to bring him back into some sort of relevancy on the timeline maybe reminding people about his power i don't know i, I just thought it'd be nice to have seen virgil there with you as well but you know r.i.p to the goat and of course um nigo had a really good interview he sat down with sorry get up on here he sat down with vogue and spelt very well about streetwear and about its effects and its influences i'll speak about it here uh yeah, this is it. Um, the fact that somebody like me with my background can now be in this role is kind of surprising. It shows in a way that things continue to change rapidly. Fashion has changed a lot in recent months, so recent times, and it's not enough now for a fashion designer to just design good clothes. Exactly. There needs to be for them to have a deeper level of communication with their audience. That's the word, communication. And he's basically one of the best communicators ever. Same way you could say for like a James Jebri at Supreme, Sean Stussy at Stussy when he was still there. Like they were some of the best communicators ever. So that's why it's no surprise when you get those guys and you put them in other places, other house, different resources. They're still able to communicate the same way, super produce the same way because at their core, they are great communicators. It continues. So just as uh, this reinvigorating, so just as this reinvigoration of Paris traditional fashion would happen in the 70s with people like Kenzo's son coming from outside of the center and moving into the center, now that everything is globally connected, there's still space for people to bring new ideas and new ways of working that change the whole business, which I agree with. It says, yeah, his approach at Kenzo is radical, rethink of luxury. When asked about the difference between street and luxury, he gives his longest and most complicated answer response. He says, the following, Nigo. From my perspective, streetwear started out as a rebellion against people, against proper fashion or luxury. It was actually counterculture, like an underground movement, which I definitely agree. That's one of the things that I kind of miss about those early streetwear days, queuing in places, being on forums, um, posting your fits on forums, like big up the FUK guys, F F U yeah, FUK.co.uk was one of my favorite places, Fifth Dimension was good, even though the guys on there were pricks, um, Super Future was good, like those couple of places where you went to kind of stunt, to share experiences and just be, you know, be about that life. And it did feel like an underground movement. It did feel like you were kind of in the in crowd. People would see you wearing some wacky trends. They'd be like, what the fuck's up with this guy? But you were kind of just living your life, doing your thing. And they had no idea. Like, you know, you were kind of wearing stuff that was worth thousands and thousands. Again, it didn't matter back in the day how much it was worth. It was just the hunt that was interesting. You know, discovering new brands, copying something that was on your grail list for ages. All these things were really, really sick. And you don't really get that nowadays because everyone knows everything. 
you got sites like Grail, sites like StockX. It's just not there's there there's no string as untapped or undiscovered thing. When as soon as you discover it, everyone kind of jumps in it, rips it to pieces. Look at Capital. Do you know what I mean great brand, completely you know overdone and overexposed to the point now where it's not really cool to wear it at all. Um, same could be said for needles, right? Many other brands. But it continues. It says, I think people um, have forgotten that because it's just become so ubiquitous that it's the norm now and streetwear, at least to the world or to proper fashion, appears to be like non-design, quote unquote. They see it as a way of making clothes that doesn't require skill of a designer, which is true, which is why I'm happy what Demner's done. Demner's basically been able to elevate Demner because people respect him. Just people can say what they want about how, you know... Um, how much of a troll he might be with his brand, especially when he was at Vetimar or stuff that maybe he was doing earlier on in Balenciaga. There's no denying the guy comes from, he's been schooled the right way, right? Maison Margiela, Louis Vuitton, like he's done the schooling. He's went to a proper fashion school. He knows how to pattern cut, like you can't muck around with him. But I like that in his first, you know, um, Haute Couture um, collection that he did for um, Balenciaga, he actually presented, you know, a couture version of a hoodie, like a hoodie that's been made you know, custom, bespoke, um, with the highest quality fabrics, right? And spent many, many thousands of hours constructing it. Jeans, like a jean jacket, I think, a hoodie, a t-shirt. He elevated these kind of basic items that were basically looked at as throwaway and brought them up to a level of luxury. So that's been quite cool to see. But in my opinion, Stuart Airbans have been doing this from day dot, from the moment people were the, the evolving to printing from like American, sorry, American, um, Fruit of the Loom, American Apparel, Gildens, um, and then decided to go into cut and sew, they decided to go and weave, you know, their own, their own cottons and stuff and make different combinations and different cuts and feels. That was when you definitely saw streetwear going from a point of just being, let me just, you know, um, do a heat press of a t-shirt to let me go actually make something from the ground up that's going to be uniquely to my brand or unique to my brand going forward. So again, so surprise that those same guys, you put them in a the fashion house, they're going to smash it. For instance, I think if you put Nick Terche from Diamond and Co. Supply in charge of, I don't know, name a brand, he'll do well. Like you put that Nick Terche in, in charge of Machino, he does pretty well. Like, I, I don't care. I think these people in fashion, in streetwear, don't mess with them. You, you put Cohen Frost in Machino, I think he'll do a good job. Like that's how legit I think their taste level is. He continues, it says, um, there was quite a lot of brands doing things I consider to be streetwear-esque, but not authentic streetwear. I'm conflicted about whether it's more interesting for luxury brands to concentrate on their expertise and develop luxury or whether it's a fusion of those things, which is something that could also say I've done from the opposite direction. That continues to be an interesting avenue to explore. I feel conflicted between wanting luxury brands to concentrate on remaining authentic to luxury and streetwear brands being represented by the people that really understand the culture and usually being in a position to fuse the, the the two enjoying it which maybe is a good little head nod to Virgil's approach to things RIP where he was like he liked to kind of fuse the high and low he liked to take the underground and obviously make, make him meet overground basically take it from you know the hood to Soho House take it from the hood to the streets of Beijing whatever it may be right and be able to kind of fuse it and I think that's basically what made him to be a legend that he is and that's probably what some of the bigger brands get and that's their ability to sell because they're able to sell it to kids on the street or kids in the block and also be able to make it desirable to kids who may be affluent neighborhoods you want to look like kids on the block it's that kind of meeting point in the middle where they basically kind of converge a little bit um, and again I think the Nigo designs for um, Kenzo show that I can't wait to I can't wait to see more of it. I think the activations for it are going to be great. Just imagine what the stores are going to look like. Um, it's just going to be awesome going forward. It really, really is. I can't wait to see how much more stuff he has coming out in the woodwork again. You know, he's got his little um, Type One. Is it Type One denim jacket on? Maybe that's human made design. I'm pretty sure it is. Great denim, of course. Great shoe choices. Just imagine what his wardrobe must look like. Just an absolute legend, absolute G. Love Nigo. So happy it worked out for Mackenzo, that first collection. And I can't wait to see more from the King. I can't wait to see more. Um, next on the list. What else we want to talk about here? Ba, 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 ba. Let's talk about this. This is interesting, isn't it? So this is courtesy of The Guardian. And this is, let me see if I can get up here. Why is it doing that? It's not letting me. Why is it? Why has it got this mad little gap here? I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So anyway, this is Kershaw the Guardian. 
So do you remember um, maybe at the at the start of the pandemic, maybe 2019, 2020, there was that thing going on with that festival in Saudi Arabia that everyone was going to in dance music, especially electronic music. People are really getting angry that their favorite artist was basically, you know, firstly playing out at, at a time when the pandemic was at its peak. So it was a kind of a quote unquote play grave sort of thing. It felt like they were, you know, they had no regard for anybody else's health and safety and they were just going out there to collect the bag and it felt inhumane and where's the humanity? Think of my grandma, blah, 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 blah. And everyone kicked up a fuss, they moaned, they bitched. Some artist got cold feet and decided to, you know, not take the money and decided to not go to the to the festival whilst other people just decided to kind of bury their head in the sand and go and hope everyone would forget about it, which they basically have forgot about it. But... I don't think anybody would have really thought this would be the case. This is close to the Guardian. It says, Vice Media secretly organized 20 million Saudi government festivals. So that festival everyone was ragging on about, getting upset about, was actually organized and designed and fronted, or not fronted, supported in the background by Vice Media, which makes sense. Again, these people in the Middle East, if you've ever worked in Harvey Nicks, you've worked in Selfridges, you worked in these luxury department stores or department store brands or luxury brands sorry fashion stores you would know these people don't mess about they're very like cold and calculated in the way they do business but they also like to delegate you know in a weird way sometimes they'll delegate for you to get their shoes out of their bags sometimes they'll delegate in terms of like hey where's a cool place to go where would you recommend you look cool you look interesting where can i go somewhere to go meet some girls where can i go somewhere to go get a drink you, you honestly when times i've been on the shop floor talking to some especially middle eastern men who want to get freaky, have some good times, they're usually pretty upfront in terms of they'll want to kind of um, acquiesce to your advice. Like, what would you say would be the best place to go? So it always was weird to me to think that somehow there was somebody within the Saudi government who was spending their time keeping abreast of who was hot, who was not, and organizing this whole event. It just seemed a little bit too much. They'd rather just be sitting down, having people carry them on their backs while they're enjoying the flipping concert, than slaving away organizing it. Because let's be for real, organizing something like this isn't fun. It's long, it's laborious. People are probably going to be dropping out their front center. You're not going to be able to get all the sponsorship you want because no one's going to put their brand next to it. It's probably a ball lake. So they had to have used a, a producer or an operator who had basically worked within that space prior and had some experience, had contacts that they could kind of lean on and to kind of pull out their, you know, out their black book in order to get the job done. And of course, what better person to go to than Vice Media? right what better person to go to than vice media if you wanted to get that sort of thing done so it's no surprise that this is a thing but it's also surprising to see a, a publication that purports to be left-leaning or liberal in some way shape or form essentially put their morals and ethics to one side in order to get the bag now i don't have a problem with it personally myself because i think i've always said we're all full of shit i'm full of shit you're full of shit we're all full of shit this thing that separates the delusional from people that are quite normal or rational people is that you are full of shit and you know it but you still talk about things you still talk from some level of you know snobbery you still pretend like you recycle even though you just chucked your snickers bar out the window but you know you're full of shit the people who are delusional are the ones who are not full of shit who are full of shit but don't know it like the people that you might meet like um vegans who are cokeheads it's like you're full of shit you can't be an ethical, you can't be a vegan and kind of bemoan and, you know, lecture people for eating meat or for supporting these sort of industries when you are essentially, you know, endorsing the um, the deaths of thousands of people to get your little gram to go out and shortage. You know what I mean? That, that is not the way forward. You can't be that much full of shit. You have to be, you have to be able to have some level of self-reflection or some level of acceptance of how much full of shit you are and then you're able to move on from life. So I think that's the, that's where the hypocrisy comes into it. But it's still fascinating to see because it says you have 20 million dollars which is by what 15 million pounds they got they got i guess it doesn't it doesn't mean they got that money maybe that was just the budget for the actual production of the whole entire festival but it's just funny just to see this relate because this could easily be resident advisor this could easily be any of these kind of platforms right who kind of purport to be um the voice of the everyday person um fighting for liberal arts fighting against these totalitarian governments and then here they are sponsoring providing for and basically working in conjunction with a government that they have no business working with especially when you think about the people that work in that kind of place you know what i mean like most of these people who are maybe from the lgbtq plus community wouldn't be welcomed you know in that kind of country living a life so they live in a very warm way so to see their company endorsing these sort of things just makes you want to laugh at it it really really does it says as follows 
when social media influencers turned up at the Azimuf, Azimuf music festival in the middle of the Saudi Arabian desert, they were promised a festival music uh, and gastronomic excess, all subsidized by an arm of the Saudi government. When attendees did not know, sorry, what attendees did not know was that the Privacy Music Festival was secretly organized by youth media company Vice as part of the media company's ongoing push to make money in Middle East um, state despite the company's poor human rights record. Just three years after, Vice publicly announced that it was pausing all work in Saudi Arabia due to a fallout from the state-ordered murder of descendant, um, dissident sorry, Jamal Khashoggi. As if... Um, insiders at Vice told the Guardian the company was once again aggressively pursuing business opportunities in Saudi. So in one point, they're speaking at one side of their mouth by saying that, you know, we've taken this death of Jamal Khashoggi seriously, the killing of the alleged killing of this journalist at the hands of the Saudi government, um, which obviously did happen if you read, you know, again, don't want to get into it, but you, you know, it probably oh, obviously did happen. They're saying one thing and on the other side, they, they are organizing a festival for you to go see fucking Amelie Lenz or whoever was playing at the time. It says as follows, vice employees have for years raised concerns over the company's involvement in Saudi Arabia, says the quote, and we've been fobbed off with empty statements and pathetic excuses. Although the uh, Asmuth Music Festival received little publicity in the Western media when it took place at the start of the COVID pandemic, it is believed to have been highly lucrative for vice. Staff at the company estimate a total budget was $20 million or $15 million. Um, the event promised to bring together a best of the East culture, Eastern culture. It took place amongst um, ancient carvings at the World Heritage Site of Al Ula on a historic trade route. With the best Western culture, it featured the performance of the dance music trio Chainsmokers. Okay, so it's a meeting of East and West alongside the trade route. Okay, I, I get it. I get the idea. The lineup was topped by French electronic music Jean-Michel Jarre, who appeared alongside rapper Tiny Temper. Tiny Temple was a headlining guest at a Saudi Arabian festival. That guy is an absolute wild I didn't <laughs> Tiny fucking Temper. High end chefs from restaurants such as New York City chefs, uh, New York City Michelin star restaurant Contra in London's Annabelle were flown in to cook for guests. British contemporary artist Lauren Baker joined the conceptual studio, Schuster Mosley to provide specialist art displays. Oh. Despite this, efforts were taken to keep Vice's name off the event. Contractors who worked on the music festival organized through Vice Corrective Agency Virtue were asked to sign non disclosure agreements while Vice's name did not appear. Uh oh. Saudi Arabia is desperate to spend big in a habit in an effort to rebrand itself in the eyes of Western youth. I also like the fact that they're doing what the I like the fact that they're doing what every other Western country does, where they pretend to be progressive, they pretend to be welcoming. But the day-to-day -day life basically, you know, is nothing like what they purport it to be. Because then some people say, oh, it's a hypocrisy. Why spend all that money? We could just change your human rights record or change the way that you um, interact or accept people that live an LGBTQ lifestyle. But they're like, why would I? Why would I do that if I can just get away with what you guys are doing? So they want to spend big to make them look as if they're progressive. But day-to-day -day living in Saudi Arabia isn't probably the easiest place to live if you are from the Western world. It says, yeah, the, co the company um, rode the new media startup wave. On the new, da, da, da. As a result, the money on offer in the Middle East um, has been tempting. And Vice last year opened a dedicated office in Saudi Arabia, capital Riyadh. There's a vice office in Riyadh. Oh, my God. It also has to deal with the promotional films for the country in conjunction with the Saudi Research and Marketing Group, a business with close ties to the Saudi state, which also has partnership with Independent Mate. Every business in Saudi Arabia has state has connection with the Saudi state. One employee claimed vice executives were actively aware of the potential reputational damage that would be caused if the Western audience became aware of the extent to which they were working with the Saudi state, saying it was astounding that despite the ongoing opposition from staff, vice still happy to take the money from the country that was literally responsible for state sanctioned murder of journalists. But the thing is, I think, is that if you are that if you have the courage of convictions, you should just quit. But I would guess the amount of people that actually stayed, the amount of people that quit, it pales in comparison. I would bet, I bet it, I bet a lot of money. People don't back their beef. They talk a big game, but when it comes down to it, they don't do jack shit. It continues, it says, asked about concerns of the staff, um, asked about concerns from staff about its return to doing business in Saudi Arabia. A spokesman for Vice said, Vice Arabia was set up over four years ago as part of our global expansion alongside many of our other media content business who have expanded into the region. Vice has always been about creativity and culture for youth in every corner of the world. And in Saudi region, two thirds of the population under 35. Oh, come on. 
We've opened its commercial and creative office in Riyadh early this year, which reported and shared publicly. Our editorial voice has and always will report with complete autonomy and independence. Bruv, come on, you can't report independence in the Saudi state. You already saw what happened to Jamal Khashoggi, my G. MBS on play. But yeah, LOL, innit? The hypocrisy is LOL. Which brought me on to, do we owe Peggy Gu an apology? Considering that Vice Media were secretively behind organizing that festival in Saudi Arabia and all the artists that were on the bill were getting all the blame, all the harassment. Are oh, you doing this? Your tra your morals and your ethics for the paycheck. Um, you don't stand for us and blah de blah blah blah. They were attacking them, the artists, because they were the ones that were most visible, the ones that were on the lineup because their names were flipping on there. Right. And some of them couldn't even advertise that they were playing on there. They would delete it from their social media feed. They would hide it. They don't share it on their stories and not make it repliable. Loads of many things are just to kind of get away from having to face any kind of scrutiny. But the one person that got it a lot was Peggy Goo, right? She seemed to get the, she seemed to bear the brunt of it for whatever reason. Cause again, at that time, I think it was just trendy to hate her, right? Because you know what? She's, you know, I think she would agree to some extent. Would she agree? Do you think she's quite um, self aware? I think she is. I think if you're, you have to be self-aware if you're Peggy Goo, innit? You have to know that people hate you for some legitimate reasons and for some unwarranted reasons. But the key to being a supreme creative is that you can't care. You can't care if the reasons are legit or if they are not legit because you just got to keep doing you. And the hope is they're both going to play off each other to keep your name hot. So the ones that don't like you will keep talking about how untalented you are, your ghost producers, your family afforded you the luxury to live in Berlin and pursue your dreams without doing anything, uh, whatever they make, they say. And your fans will basically say everything you do is hot. Like, oh, your shirt's as good as Prada. She's so hot. She makes the best tunes. Her singing's amazing. So you're going to get gassed up and you're going to get hated in equal amounts. And that's going to keep your name popping. That's the key to it. But most people that crack are the ones that take the criticism too harshly or too seriously or they take the praise too seriously and start believing the gas. You can't get too gassed up and you can't get too down on what people say. So I think my inkling would be she's probably more self-aware than most people because I don't think you could be that successful and not be self-aware but also just not give a shit. But anyway, the point remains. She was the one that was getting a lot of criticism, right, about the Saudi Arabia festival, right? People going at her and throwing stones and saying whatever and at the time i thought what she said was nuts but looking back on it especially you consider vice media was behind this flipping thing secretively i want to see what she has to say so uh da -da -da -da. yeah here it goes da -da -da -da. yeah it's good so this is a quote about the the festival right this is from an article in id magazine in 2020 it says the following when i asked her about her recent gig in saudi arabia a controversial mbdl beach festival which is different from the one i'm speaking about i think peggy looked hesitant since straying a, to a close a few weeks back the inaugural edition of the three-day music festival and um, reportedly organized by the saudi entertainment authority and vice has been under fire washington post opinion writer karen atia model teddy quilvlian and instagram account diet prada are among those accusing high-profile attendees visibly paid to post flattering content about the experience in riyadh or partaking in the pr campaign to rehabilitate the kingdom's image in light of recent human rights abuses maybe including the death of journalist Jamal Khashoggi definitely including his death but again what can you do it continues that's like saying that's like saying um everyone that plays in America is somehow condoning the death of thousands at the flipping world trade building who who do you think did that like who do you think was who do you think was somewhat complicit in those buildings coming down who didn't send out the planes in time in order to kind of you know counteract the planes going into the building in the first place who turned a blind eye to these guys you know coming over to the country in the first place and gaining passports and be able to fly like anyway let's just continue she says you know what peggy says eventually i'm going to talk about it having shared a lineup with the likes of david Gita and steve gaioki imagine oh, again sometimes i manage used to give her a little bit of a heads up imagine being alongside david imagine going to play a festival in saudi arabia and being sandwiched in between david getter and steve aoki god damn it man but i get the money's just too good i guess and it just is what it is she continues um she deplores the storm of online criticism she received in which people called her a sellout you can't call her a sellout because she was never in like like she was never underground she like 
I don't I don't think anybody thought she was some scrappy girl that grew up on the mean streets of Seoul and you know with her last money bartending decided to move to Berlin to go pursue a career that was never the narrative it was just you know it's cool I I thought the whole idea behind it was that she was cool looking cute Asian girl who made sick music who also DJed and didn't wear all black so it was quite a cool novelty to see somebody that looked you know um demonstrably different than anybody else that exists out there especially when you consider most of the females in dj especially at that time all look like male equivalents right they just look stark and bleak and cold didn't look like they smile didn't look like they enjoyed orange juice do you know what I mean look like they just drank black tea and black coffee whereas for her she actually looks like she might enjoy a buddha bowl from time to time like that's probably what was part of the appeal i don't think anyone thought she was some underground guy or underground girl sorry Anyway, it continues. Since posting a video from the festival to her 1.3 million followers, um, the quote here, influencers are a different story, she protests, highlighting the fact that she was the only female headliner at the festival, which she believes can help transform the local music scene. All right, Peggy, relax. No one in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> does she legitimately think that girls that live in Saudi Arabia are going to be able to emulate her career in any way, shape or form if their family don't approve of it? Like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Anyway, continue. Um, Da, da, da. she says i went there to play music for fans she clarifies this may seem like a reasonable position but it isn't one shared by everybody just last summer Nicki minaj pulled out of a gig in saudi's jihad jada award festival over concerns about women's rights lgbtq rights and the freedom of expression a move endorsed by the new york-based human rights foundation now i don't think peggy Goo has a big lgbtq plus fan base i wouldn't think she does from what i've seen on social and especially being in places i've worked in mostly girls like her and obviously boys fancy her but for the most part she's got a crazy amount of actual girl fans which is really odd because i don't think you see i don't think you see many girl fans at nina kravitz shows you don't really see many girl fans at amy lens shows charlotte the wit it's usually really horny like you know uh techno twitter flipping uh greasy guys going to those kind of people's gigs to go and maybe chin stroke how they transition or to go and have a wank in a corner but legitimately you look at videos of peggy Goo playing you see bare girls so there might be some something to what she's saying about being some sort of figurehead but i also i also think in that regard it's hard to have the whole lgbtq thing because she doesn't really represent them so women's rights is like mm, what what is in terms of um in terms of uh, oppression Olympics, what's higher, or what's or, or what's more of an what's more of an oppressed group, LGBTQ plus folk or women? I say LGBTQ plus folk, especially in the public conversation. Maybe not in actuality, but in terms of the public's conversation and you know whatever, maybe LGBTQ rights comes above. So if you want to you know put your morals and ethics to one side if you represent women you can basically still do the festival and you can maybe sleep all at night but it's very very difficult if you're Nicki Minaj and you have a very you know rabid gay queer fan base to turn a blind eye and go perform in Saudi Arabia that'll be a real slap in the face to your fan base that'll be something that'll be very difficult for people to reconcile with if they're your fans very very difficult especially when you're incredibly wealthy anyway if, if if they know you're struggling i think people will realize okay cool she's struggling she needs some money get the paper secure the bag yes queen slay but if they know you're wealthy like it's going to be hard to justify why this 1.5 million is going to be different from the other 1.5 million you made the other day do you know what i mean anyway it continues but since previously facing backlash for canceling a set at dgto tel aviv in 2018 she had to apologize for an announcement she posted online self-described naturally selective peggy goo explains that she's learned her lesson now preferring to stay out of politics she says the following it doesn't matter if it's israel or north korea she concludes after admitting that her Saudi Arabia stint involved a substantial paycheck. If she's, if people want to hear my music, I will go. I don't give a fuck. And I have to respect that. I have to respect that. Cause this goes back to what I said about Asa Brocky. You might not like his comments regarding Black Lives Matter. You might not like his comments regarding, you know, uh, activism and all that sort of malarkey. But essentially he was basically saying, unless I'm about that life, unless I'm doing what J. Cole is doing and I'm actually on the ground, you know, on the front line, contributing, helping, uh, putting my best foot forward in a selfless way, not wanting to get any sort of press from it, just doing it from the purest of my heart, I can speak about it. But if I'm not, and I'm here in these Soho flats gallivanting around with a bunch of Latina women and white women, you know, who always want to want to flip and get in my trunks, 
it makes no sense why I should be commenting on, you know, the, the riots or the unrest in Ferguson or the protests happening on the back of the George Floyd situation. Why would I do that? Or George Floyd death story. Why would I do that? And same thing goes for here with Peggy Goo. She's like, I have no interest in politics. I don't care. I'm a hot girl, I guess, pay to play music. I make great music. People like my fashion. They like me as a person, right? I get flown around these different places. I don't have, and I, th I think in general, if you're at that level of person, you probably don't have time or the bandwidth to actually have a nuanced opinion about politics anyway. So why bother getting involved? Why engage if you don't gonna say anything interesting? Because if you're gonna say something interesting, most likely it's going to disrupt your bag. And usually if you're at that level, you only care about the bag. Because if you're being honest, if you are politically aware or politically motivated, there would be no way you'd accept a gig at Saudi Arabia. There'd be no way, right? If you have some sort of, whatever political ideology you fall into would never allow you to stand and kind of be okay to accept money from that state. It wouldn't happen. But when you're not politically motivated, and you just want to do it purely for the music and purely for the bag, or maybe the bag first and the music second, these sort of messages ring clear. So maybe in my head, I'm thinking, you know what? We might owe Peggy Goo Peggy an apology. She maybe was right all along. This may be the right way to go about things. If you like, just don't engage in politics, go for the bag, do your music and keep it moving. Wherever your fans are, you play for them. You're basically a servant to your fans. And it's no surprise that despite all the ups and downs and all the trials and tribulations, I've obviously commenting on a few myself regarding Daniel Wang. She's stood, she stood the test of time. Let's be real. Again, I'm not, I don't check up on her mostly. I don't know what she's doing, but for the most part, it feels like she's still around. People still, she's still get booked and busy. Collaborations coming out of her ass. People want to, you know, people want to get next to her. She got the rub, like whatever she's doing, she's doing it well and she's still around. And it's not, you know, I know you get paid to be put in certain magazines and you get interviewed in certain places, but sometimes if you're able to last the test of time, it's not because your, your plant is because people actually like you. And like I said, I've worked in many different places, cool places, uncool places. And one thing I can know for sure, all the boys I've worked with in these uncool or cool places, they love Solomon. He's, he seems to be one of the people that seems to resonate with normies and Peggy Goo. They're the two people that wherever office you, workplace you go to, someone's going to be playing a mix of them too on a Friday for the people juiced and ready to go out on the night out. So maybe that's the way to go about things. Just don't give a fuck and focus on your art. It's a bit difficult pill to swallow, especially for people that are politically motivated to hear that sort of stuff because, you know, when you're politically motivated, everything matters. Everything's life or death. But in a grand scheme of things, if you don't really have nothing interesting to say and you're not that well informed, keep your mouth shut. You're just going to create more confusion. You're going to get more people angry at you. You're going to just say the wrong thing. Um, you're going to sound dumb. You're going to sound ignorant. It's just not worth it. And if you've been put in this earth to create music, to create art, whatever it may be, maybe your attention should be on that completely and not on the other thing because you don't really have the skill for it or the bandwidth. Maybe, who knows? Maybe. But yeah, that has been the Agassino Zinger Show episode number, what I say? I forgot what I said, I said, but you know, you heard at the beginning of the show. <laughs> if you enjoyed it and you liked what you heard, make sure you smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you don't, uh, I don't mind. And um, Patreon episode is going to go out tomorrow. So if you're on a Patreon, definitely check that out. It's going to be out later on tomorrow. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Apart from that, thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. I'll see you guys again very, very soon. If you're listening to the podcast app, you hear a song. If you're watching the YouTube, you'll just end right here. Until next time, my friends. Peace.